Okay, so this chapter starts out 10 years later, 10 years after they came onto the island. So they went through four or five years on the various different things where it's like, okay, new rainy season, new year, new rainy season, new year. And here they're just skipping ahead 10 years. So the youngest child is now 17. The oldest is 24. And when Fritz, the oldest, went out on his own exploring, he found a rag with a note tied to the leg of an albatross. Now, an albatross is a big, big bird. You know, I discussed this in Moby Dick. These things are huge. And they travel over great distances of ocean. So this is a relatively good bird to tie a message to. And whoever it was is lucky that Fritz found it. Um, hopefully he'll find her. But uh, we'll see about that in the next chapter. But um, the father decided that Fritz was going to go off on this search and that it wasn't right to warn every to tell everyone about it to get their hopes up because this is a long shot. She might not be on the same island. She might not be even on a close island because, you know, as I said, albatrosses, they cover thousands and thousands of miles. So, I mean, this woman could be anywhere in the ocean um, because, I mean, it could be anywhere in the ocean. So... The father didn't want to let everyone know, get their hopes up, get this big thing going. And Fritz, and he thought Fritz was right to try and find her. So he made a de declaration that, you know, Fritz is now old enough to go out on his own and to be just completely independent and be his own man. And Fritz is 24, and that's a reasonable -ish age. And there's a whole bunch of different ages where somebody becomes officially an adult. And in the U.S., there's a variety of them. At 16, you can drive. 18, you can sign contracts. 21, you can drink alcohol. At 25, you can um, your insurance rates go down, and it's easier to get a car and buy a car and things like that. 26, you can stay you can stay on your parents' insurance until you're 26 years old. Uh, at least at the time of this, when you get to be 26, that may not be the rule anymore. Uh, anyway, so, you know, there's a whole bunch of different ages, and the father said, you yeah, 24, that's full grown. Now, they've done research in the study of the brain, and children's brains are different than adults' brains. Uh, children's brains are more plastic, uh, they change more. Uh, they don't necessarily, children don't necessarily have the best judgment, they are more easily persuaded. So, uh, in that ends that stops the brain kind of gels in where it is and is fully developed at about age 24 so that's just that's the number that i've read so you know there have been a whole bunch of people who said no adulthood shouldn't really be 21 or 18 it's like no you should push it even further because 21 year olds 22 year olds are still doing really stupid things um and so, actually, with the brain development, there's this weird sort of plateau around 12 where kids get really seriously logical, but they don't necessarily still have the best judgment. They're still easily persuadable. But around 12, they have this really good judgment, and then it just, like, gets worse for a little while and then finally gets better. And then around 24, it plateaus. But there's this weird sort of plateau at, at 12, where 12 year olds are more responsible than 16 year olds. But I'm not saying that I would let a 12 year old drive a car because, you know, well, maybe slowly in the parking lot. But uh, so they go out and they find oysters. Now, uh, I grew up in Maryland. So Maryland has the Chesapeake Bay, which is like oysters everywhere, or was oysters everywhere. There were overfishing and outbreaks of various diseases and they thought it almost went extinct they were worried that it's like okay oysters are going to be going extinct in a few years and they've somewhat recovered but um oysters were everywhere in the chesapeake bay and there's a big long tradition of it and there were a couple of ways of getting oysters and one of the first ways was um they had tongs so imagine these 20 foot long poles with metal rakes down at the bottom and a little hinge. 
So what you do is you take the tongs, you lower them down into the water 20 feet, push, uh, pull them apart, and the bottoms come together, and it just crepes up a bunch of oysters, and you pull all of this up out of the boat, dump it on the deck, and you do this again. And that worked fairly well. And then in the 1800s, they come up with came up with dredges. And those started out in New England. And uh, the way the dredge worked was it was a bag with these uh, teeth. And you would pull the boat. And the boat would pull this along the bottom. It'd scrape up along the bottom. And just pull all of the oysters in the net. And it's hideously destructive, but incredibly efficient. And that's one of the things that happened to a lot of the, one of the reasons why the oysters went away. But there's all sorts of places up along the Chesapeake Bay where they made streets from ground oyster shells. So there are places where you will just see these oyster shells everywhere. Because what they would do is they'd harvest the oysters, they'd take the meat out and they'd throw away the shells, and they'd throw away the shells, and they'd throw away the shells, and they'd throw away the shells. And they'd just pile up, and they put them down on the road, and the vehicles would roll over them and crush them. And I say vehicles, I mean carts drawn by horses. So the carts drawn by horses and the horses and you know, all this stuff would crush the oysters. And so you had these roads that were made out of crushed oyster shells. Um, and oyster shells are mostly calcium carbonate, which is the same thing that's limestone. So it's not particularly, it's almost in a way you're making it out of concrete, but not quite. Um, it's, it's limestone, essentially. It's it's calcium carbonate. Uh, so it's a good a use is it for any. Um, but anyway, roads made out of oyster shells. And so here you have the Swiss family Robinson, and they're tonging away with the oysters in those. And the lion attacks. And once again, you're not going to find lions on islands, just like you won't find elephants on islands. And um, But, you know, they find the lion. They fight the lion, and poor Juno died. And, you know, it's sad that the dog died, but, you know, the dog died saving them, which is a very important thing because, you know, the dog, well, the dog was getting old. I mean, think about it. Dogs, 15, 20 years. So the dog was full grown. So the dog was probably three to five when they got on the island. So the dog is pushing 15. She's probably gray. She's probably getting old and tired and so you know yes the dog died saving them but you know she was getting old and she was well loved and she was well mourned um truffles truffles uh truffles are fungus they grow under trees uh very popular in france popular in french cooking they have a very strong flavor very mushroomy i'm not a fan uh, some people like them. Truffles get stupid expensive uh, because they only grow under oak trees and they're hard to find. And People still use dogs to go hunt them down. Um, dogs and pigs, actually. So they have pigs which are trained to find truffles and dogs which are trained to find truffles. And the pigs are better at finding the truffles, but the pigs will try and eat the truffles. So what happens is, is if you have a pig, you're more likely to find truffles, but it's about the same chance of getting them because the pig finds one and swallows it. So it's kind of a mix there, which, which is better to get a truffle, a dog or a pig, but that's the same way that they, um, they're still digging them up the same way they used to, um, because of the way they interact with oak trees and such. They have had a hard time farming them. So this is not something that you can farm. They've tried farming them. They've tried growing them in special conditions. But they end up not quite tasting like a truffle. And so if you're going to pay hundreds of dollars a pound for something, you want it to taste like it's supposed to taste. So, And it'll be hard to say, oh, here, yes, pay $30 a pound for this farm truffle that doesn't taste anywhere near as good as a real one. But uh, so anyway, they um, they got the they got the truffles, they got the pearls, 
And Fritz is out looking for the lost English woman near the smoking rock. Which the dad thinks is a volcano. The son thinks, ah, oh, that could be something else. Well, it might be something else. Uh, could be a volcano still. This is a huge island if it has elephants and lions on it. So, you know, maybe it is. Maybe she's not even on that island. And as I said before, a few chapters back, talking about atolls, which are low and flat, and this has mountains, so it's probably volcanic. There's a good chance that there could be a volcano on some other part of the island, or a dormant one, or an extinct one. Uh, it's actually, there are some places where there's lava kind of close to the surface, and it's not enough pressure to erupt. It's not enough to, you know, it's not enough to erupt or anything like that. But it um, gets water in, and so it just kind of constantly steams. So there may be a situation like that, uh, geothermal spring or something similar to that. But I'm sure that Fritz will find the girl, and then he will have an explanation for what the smoking rock is. So this is added on. I was a little bit hasty in stopping the last video. Your lolly was frantically gesturing, don't, off screen. It's because she wanted me to tell you that volcanoes, about volcanoes. See, just a couple of days ago, there was a major volcanic eruption in Tonga, or in as part of Tonga. Tonga is a set of islands in the South Pacific, and it's on the Ring of Fire. So the Ring of Fire is a chain of uh, fault lines that circle the entire Pacific. And there's a lot of earthquakes and volca vol volcanoes and things like that associated with it. Tonga is in the southwestern corner of the Ring of Fire, uh, southwestern edge of the Ring of Fire. Uh, Japan is on the Ring of Fire. That's why all the mountains in Japan, Mount Fuji is a volcano. Uh, so the, mount, the volcanoes in Japan come from that. Uh, the Aleutian Islands are formed similar to that. They're on the Ring of Fire. Uh, the San Andreas Fault that runs down California and causes major earthquakes every few years in L.A. and San Francisco is on the Ring of Fire. So anyway, in Tonga, a few days ago, I'm sure you've heard of this and will hear about this and have heard about this, and there was a volcanic island. So there were these two islands that were there, and a volcano came up in the middle. And when the volcano came up in the middle, lava flowed out and made an island. Because, you know, you have the lava flows up from the bottom of the sea. And when the lava flows up from the bottom of the sea, it hardens into a rock. And then more lava flows up, and that hardens into a rock, and hardens into a rock. Until eventually you have lava all the way up. And with the lava all the way up, you know, you have lava all the way up. And then once it breaks the top, you have an island, just like the Crusoe, Robinson Crusoe, or the Swiss family Robinson were on their island. So this island came up in a big volcano. But a few days ago, there was a massive, massive eruption. One of the largest eruptions in the last 40 years. Um, it's probably the largest eruption in the last 40 years. And it... Uh, 89, right? 89 was Mount St. Helens. No, it was before that. Anyway, probably one of the largest volcanic eruptions in the last 40 years or so. And it... 1980. Okay, 1980 was Mount St. Helens, which was about the same size, maybe... I, I can't remember which one is bigger, but both of these were just huge, huge eruptions. They're these do not occur that often. I think I saw something that said this may have been the largest eruption since the 1800s when Krakatoa disappeared. And that was a case of an entire island just going, Pff. in this case, an entire island went boom. Well, well, not the entire island. The... Can, I, can I jump in? Yes. In 2014, 2014. In 2014. The two, there were two islands. There were two islands. And then the volcano. And then the volcano came up between them. And made one big island. And made one big island. And then with this eruption. Yes. With this eruption ago, a few days ago. The tsunami. The tsunami. Tsunami big wave came through. 
and separated those two islands. And separated those two islands. So, so this island had been around for... This island had been around for, I guess seven, that's eight years. Seven, seven years, seven and eight years. So this island had been around for seven or eight years and then is gone. And there was a massive explosion, huge plumes of dust, huge plumes of sulfur dioxide. So the, the southern hemisphere is going to be cooling down quite a bit because of this. Um, this is the type of explosion that can, that can set global warming back years. Um, this, this is the type of explosion that just changes climate. Um, similar explosions have led to something called the year without a summer, where because of the ash, it was just cold and there was snow in June um, because it was just, it darkened the sun. And this is an explosion on a similar scale. So uh, we'll see what happens. Um, it'll, it'll, it probably will be bad for Australia and Southern Africa and um, for 18, farming there. 1816, year without a summer. 1816, year without a summer. So this is a volcano explosion on the same scale as that. And that was another ring of fire volcanic island exploding and then just disappearing stuff. Um, this huge, huge, I mean, you can't imagine how big these explosions are. There are great videos that I will link to uh, in the comments of this of the shockwave you can see the shockwave spread through the atmosphere covering the entire you can just see this explosion it's like a bomb going off well okay bomb it was bomb more force than it was more force than the largest nuclear explosion ever done which is insane in a lot of ways because the largest nuclear bomb was something that the soviets did to show off of hey we can build really really big nukes well the thing is is that that nuke was so big that it had to be built on site and couldn't be it couldn't be deployed it was the type of thing that you build it if you want to get rid of an area of your own land because you just couldn't even ship it so it's a huge huge bomb but anyway so this was bigger than the largest nuclear explosion ever made so this is bigger than anything that humans have ever done and this is the type of thing that happens every 200 years uh so that was a huge volcanic explosion, uh, but maybe, hopefully, Fritz's smoking rock won't be anywhere near that big or destructive. Ten megatons. Ten megatons? No, there's bigger bombs than that. Well, they're saying this Tonga was ten megatons. Okay, they're saying Tonga was ten megatons. I think people are people are confusing numbers here because the biggest nuclear weapon ever done was a hundred. This is our bomba. Ivy Mike was 30 or something like that. And I was kind of an oops. They didn't think it'd be that big. But nuclear weapons. Uh, weird from the Swiss family Robinson because, you know, Swiss is neutral and peaceful. And anyway, uh, big volcano. Bigger than Hiroshima. Bigger than Hiroshima. Okay. The bomb dropped on Hiroshima. Yeah. That was a small bomb. But, uh, Okay, so, but 10 megatons is nothing to sniff at. 10 megatons is like wiping out cities. That's stupid big. Um, that is stupid. Well, wiped out an island. Uh, stupid big. So, anyway, this is, yeah, this is beyond imagining. And maybe there'll be another island. Uh, hopefully things will go well with this. But uh, I don't know. 